So a very good evening, a good morning, and a good afternoon to all of you who are gathered here today um, uh, for listening to Yolanda Boss, who is with us. Uh, and um, before I start, uh, I would uh, request all of you uh, to mute your mics, please, and uh, stop your videos so that we get a good bandwidth for the lecture, because many of us are connecting to places like the Himalayas or the desert or places like that. So uh, the whole scenario would be, we finish the talk in about 45 minutes to one hour, then we have a question and answer session where you'll raise your hands. And in the order, I find the hands raised, I will pose the questions where you'll give a brief introduction for you about yourself. And you can ask the questions directly to Yolanda with your mics and videos up by then. Uh, for those of you who are joining for the first time, I'm uh, Sonali Gupta, Dr. Sonali Gupta. I'm the director of the Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies based in Kulu Valley, but I'm not in Kulu Valley. I'm right now in Los Angeles, but that's how life is. Corona makes you stuck at places you don't want to be stuck at. So Yolanda, today is about uh, this wonderful talk that she has on whales, on hair, on makeup, on wearable heritage. Yolanda, I have known for, a ver for very many years, and there are a few here on this platform who know of her as well. She is an archaeologist and a heritage consultant. During the last 15 years, she has worked in different excavations in the Sahara, okay, the greatest, the largest desert in the world. Uh, Yolanda also studies ancient beadwork and collects costume and personal adornment, the combination of dress, whales, jewelry, and amulets from the West Asian and East African region, and very soon from the Indian region as well. Yeah. Um, uh, she and her partner have um, this uh, wonderful publishing house, Bilksweld, which means insight. And uh, it gives me immense pleasure in letting you all know that we are working together to start the first journal for the Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies with her publishing house. And of course, uh, Dr. Anjali Kapila here, uh, I don't know, I can't see her, but her, uh, she, she really wanted this to move forward. And uh, all these talks that we've been having, we want to translate them into articles and have the first journal from the Himalayas in the Himalayas, you know, in the Himalayas, from the Himalayas. So we do have journals, but they're not published from the Himalayas. So we want to do that. And I welcome you all for suggestions. We'll have a peer review board and everything like that. So uh, coming back to our speaker today, Yolanda, uh, we, like I said, we go back uh, very many years. We met in um, our project in the Fayum. And uh, Yolanda has immense experience in the field of archeology. span uh, She has worked in one of the oldest trading ports uh, called Berenike, which had trade, which had trade with India. Um, and those of you who are interested in reading about Berenike, please do. And the kind of um, affection that others have for Yolanda is uh, very, very evident. If you go to, like when I went to Berenike, in 2012, uh, the people there, the workers there said, oh, how is Yolanda? How is she doing? How are her daughters doing? Like, uh, they, they, uh, you know, Yolanda was very young when she was there, but they still remember her with so much of happiness and they have these broad smiles on their faces. And that tells you about a person, about um, how much she loves the land, the landscape and archaeology. So here I am bringing to you Yolanda, my dear, dear friend, who will talk about her favorite topic, Yolanda, yes. over to you. And um, please share with us a little bit about yourself, which I may not have revealed to the audience. Okay, I will do so. Um, yes. I think you did, you did yes. a wonderful introduction. Yeah, I'm just muting uh, a few who forgot to mute themselves. So, uh, yeah, that's better. Okay. Over can here. I share my screen as well? Uh, yes, I, you can. Okay, good. Um, 
just a minute. Yes, this should, this should work. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, lovely. Okay, so for me, it's very strange to be talking on Zoom because not so much because I've, I've been doing it quite, quite a bit for these past three months or six months it is, but I really dislike it because I, if I give a lecture, it would be really, I really like the, you know, going back and forth with the people I'm talking to. And, but, so, but I'll try my best to keep you all um, entertained for the next hour or so. Um, as Sonali already told you, I will talk about veils, hairstyles and eye makeup or coal. And I hope to give you an impression about what this wearable heritage can tell you about a people. Um, and then of course I must go to the next one, yes. Um, so this is me working uh, in uh, the Netherlands. I'm an archeologist, trained as an archeologist, but I'm doing a lot of work as a dress historian as well. And for me, dress is like all elements of costume, jewelry, hairstyle, body decoration, and all associated objects, actually. Um, you can see me here working on some face veils and I will be talking about those as well. Um, I'm almost going to say, in my time off, I also run a publishing firm, but that's really the other way around. Um, so I'm uh, the archeologist uh, in my time off and usually I'm uh, running this firm, Blickfeld Publishers. You can see the web link if you like to visit us on the website, www.blikveldutgevers.nl. We're a Dutch publishing firm, but nevertheless, we publish a lot of books in English and other languages. Uh, this is what our website looks like. And um, well, I'd be interesting uh, if you were ever interested in publishing about subjects that are uh, that you usually can't publish in large publishing houses, we are interested in doing those and, uh, you know, disseminating information that really needs to see uh, the light of day as a book or as a magazine. Um, so we publish magazines and books, uh, both academic and popular scientific. Uh, on the left, you can see um, some of our magazines lying. We have Métier, which is a magazine on arts and crafts. Um, and then on the right, there are some of our books that we've done in the field of cultural heritage, archeology, span but also natural heritage. So that's basically our field. We do a lot of other books as well, but this is basically what we're interested in. And we distribute the books via Oxbow and Casemate. So it goes, to a lot of international clients as well. But enough about, um, about our publishing firm. Today, I'm going to talk to you about wearable heritage and lots of subjects that I'm really passionate about. Um, you see three of the books that I've done on the subject in recent years, uh, Objects of the Day, small booklet on my favorite objects. But also um, Egypt Wearable Heritage, which has a lot of articles um, about Egypt specifically. And then on the lower part of the slide, you see Painted Black, which is my favorite book so far that I've done on all containers. And I will be talking about that as well today. For me, wearable heritage is much broader than just dress. It's actually anything that's wearable or portable and that is valued as heritage at the same time. Now, my, my region is not so much India or the Himalayas or Asia, but more West Asia and then North African region. That mostly has to do with the fact that I am an archeologist and trained in, uh, as an Egyptologist as well. So this is where I started my work uh, about 20 years ago. And this is where I also, you know, um, feel or mostly went to and felt most at home. Um, so I'm not saying I wouldn't be interested in, uh, in India and the uh, Himalayas, of course, I and mean, that's why Sonali and I are going to, you know, work together and do great projects. But in the meantime, I'm going to tell you about case studies that would also be interested maybe for the field of heritage studies in India. So I was going to tell you, um, 
you know, what may wearable heritage tell you about a society or people? And I was going to do so by showing you three case studies, coal containers, hairstyles, and face veils. Um, so when you're looking at wearable heritage, what might you be able to deduce from uh, the objects you're looking at? So you're often you find in a museum or anywhere as a collector, you find um, like, like this, like um, uh, jewelry, armlets or earrings or a nose ring even. And you will have to you know, make a story. You will have to uh, talk about uh, what, what is this? What are these objects? How were they used? What do they mean? And this is actually, um, this can be very tricky <laughs> because obviously you will never be able to see um, the person behind it when you're only looking at the objects themselves. But it does show you a lot of things as Sonali said in the introduction um, um, a day ago. Um, it tells you something about the wearer without words. So any person can signal or tell you with the veils they're wearing or with the jewelry that she's wearing that she's married, for instance, that she's had children. It's really like a form of communication without talking, without words. So that is one of the things that I find most interesting about uh, this wearable heritage. So um, over to the coal project or the coal containers that I've been studying. This is one such container. It's actually a pretty nice one. I think it's from Palestine. It's completely decorated with, um, with beadwork and tassels and embroidery coins. And it has a very small glass flasks, flask. Now, um, they vary in size, they vary in shape and decoration. Um, and this is only one of them. I will show you a lot more. For instance, this one, this is a silver one uh, from Libya. And let me just see if I can move the video back up. Yes, uh, it's about actually the coal project that I did is about studying the materiality of a tradition of the tradition of using coal or makeup. Now you can see the woman in the center of the picture. She is she has an eyeliner. She used eyeliner. She used coal in her eyes, but also in her eyebrows. And on the right of the image, you see um, two stones, which is lead sulfide um, and galena, actually. And um, it's ground to a powder form and then applied to the eyelids in many uh, places of the world. I believe in India that mostly soot, lamp soot is used, but you can correct me later on if I'm wrong. Um, so you burn a candle a week and you collect the soot and then you scrape it off and you put it in your container or in your coal container, whatever you're using. Um, these coal containers, you see one on the left from Libya, as I said. So you grind the material, put it in the container and then apply it to your eyes with the small stick or needle as it's sometimes called. Um, you apply it to your eyelids. So, Coal is used worldwide by men, women, and children alike for various reasons. For instance, as medicine against eye infections or um, well, obviously for beautification reasons, but also for physical and magical protection, cleansing properties, part of rituals and marking different phases of life, such as rites of passage. Um, you see this leather container from West Africa on the left. Um, and I've tried in this presentation to put uh, images or pictures that I picked from the internet um, to show you what the people who use oh, this specific form, what they look like. Um, so this is why I put this Polani child uh, from West Africa uh, in this picture, because I think it's, uh, it's interesting to, um, to see what, you know, the differences in coal containers, uh, what kind of people, uh, use it. Anyway, um, of course, this is not a picture from Pharaonic Egypt, but I like the, uh, but I like the image very much because this is how I imagine that people must have, you know, um, looked like when they were using this, uh, when they were using this coal in antiquity. In Pharaonic Egypt, 
um, often simple read containers were used. And they were sort of throwaway packages, or you could see it as a refill for more personal uh, containers. But you can also imagine that some people simply left the call in there and applied it to their eyelids from these containers. Now, these specific containers were found in the tomb of a, of a noble woman um, who lived around, uh, what is it, 15, 1400 BC. And um, she used it as refill packages. So she has a much more uh, elaborate glass coal container that she, uh, that she used. And whenever the coal was done, this is what she would, uh, this is what she would use to fill it up with. Um, and pharaonic coal containers, uh, they developed over time um, a lot more and they became a lot more, um, um, they had a lot more forms uh, over time when they started out basically simple. And as you can see in this picture on the left, you can see if I can use the pointer to show this to you. I hope this works. Anyway, these um, coal containers were used in the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom uh, from about um, 200, and, uh, um, sorry, 2500 to 1600 BCE. And at that time, when the New Kingdom started, they had um, an explosion of different shapes. So for instance, they had these um, coal containers with um, multiple compartments from 1500 BCE onwards. And then they started to having these reed containers that were actually uh, made from faience or glass imitating reeds. And then these beautiful um, uh, multi-chrome glass containers uh, appeared on the scene. So there was this explosion of uh, shapes around the New Kingdom. And I was wondering when I was doing my research, you know, what, what is that? Is that just style or is it just um, um, like fashion? Although uh, we, they don't have fashion the way we do, but um, is it just, um, you know, a development of styles or are there maybe other reasons behind these changes of forms? So what if this typological development of ancient coal containers was based on more than just styles or fashion? So how do you approach a research um, for these coal containers, because obviously we can't see who used it, why they used it. So is there an analogy possible between the past and the present? So I started looking at living tradition of coals and its materiality for better understanding the ancient ones. So um, what other aspects may have shaped these ancient coal containers? Um, for that, I well, and for other reasons, but that was one of the reasons why I looked at, uh, at Egyptian coal containers or North African coal containers for a while. And again, here, these slide shows uh, different ones um, decorated with glass beads and small glass vessels uh, from Egypt. And again, I put an image on the left uh, or in the background showing what the person who might have used this could have looked like in that times. Now the uh, coal containers on the top right, they are uh, from the 18th, 19th century Egypt. And the one uh, below is an Egyptian coal container that was made over a century later with plastic beads uh, and uh, tassels. It was used in the 1980s. And it's interesting to see that the shape is very much the same. The tradition is very much uh, you know, stable, I guess, in, um, over time here. These, this is also one from, from Egypt, from Nubia, actually the south of Egypt. And here, as well as in other areas, people often use a very personal container that at the same time also doubles as an amulet. So the container itself is often hung in houses or worn or carried around as, uh, as some sort of an amulet. Um, the coal is bought separately as powder or it's actually homemade often and then they store this into these um, large containers. This one is actually, it's not very small, it's like 15 centimeters in length, um, like 10, 7 centimeters in width, so it's um, you could actually, you can hold on to it. It's very, it's a very 
nice one. It has three like towery structures on the top and actually only the middle one can contain coal. So it's, um, so, um, well, it's from Nubia, but still made in the same tradition as the earlier ones from Egypt that I was showing. Although this one is very different. This is from the Siwa Oasis in Egypt, close to the Libyan border. There they use reeds that they cover with leather and it's decorated with embroidery, but also with, uh, with um, small um, buttons, mother of pearl buttons. And the embroidery actually symbolizes the ripening stages in the process of growing dates. And this is um, their main produce in the, um, in the oasis. And it's interesting to see that these, as well as the other ones that I showed you before, are also used as house amulets. Um, they protect the house and stimulate fertility, for instance, for the woman who owns them. They're very big. They're like 30 centimeters in length. So the reeds are very, uh, are very large, actually. Um, something completely different from Yemen, where the containers are uh, made of silver. And what is interesting, I think, is that these, um, as you can see, that the silver that the person is wearing in the image is very similar to the uh, silver that is used for the coal containers. You can see that the people from Yemen actually consider these containers to be part of their uh, jewelry set. So as a contrast to the Egyptian ones, which is obviously not seen as jewelry, as an item of jewelry, this, these ones from Yemen are. And this gives you another idea of, um, of how to look at these containers, um, that you can see them as part of, um, for instance, um, as part of a jewelry, uh, part of jewelry items. Now in Africa, from the Tuareg, the, they look completely different. They're small leather, um, leather containers. They are very much the domain of the supernatural, they're amulets, they have protective powers. And as you can see, they have leather thongs by which they can be suspended or hung. And this of course has to do with the fact that they're a nomadic population. Um, so they have to be able to carry these carry these things around. They're very small coal containers and they're sometimes part of necklaces. So they're suspended from a necklace with beads and they're hung, uh, sometimes they're, they're kept in a fold of cloth, but most of the times they're hung around their neck uh, as, part of their, as part of their jewelry. Um, this is from the Ababda um, in Egypt and Sonali and I have um, both excavated uh, in the area that's now inhabited by the Ababda in the, um, in the southeast of Egypt, in Egypt's eastern desert. And what I thought, what I found when studying these uh, traditional coal containers, but this, this is the culture with the largest variety in shapes and material sizes. So they have um, very small containers that are made of the fruit of the dome palm, uh, tree. You can see the one in the middle, the small one with the letter thingy sticking out. That's the smallest container I've got. It's actually like this big, a few centimeters high. And then there's the other one to the to the left of it, um, which is actually a pot shirt that they pasted something onto. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's also a fruit of a of a dome palm, and they decorated it with beadwork, and it can actually contain quite a bit of uh, coal, whereas the other one in the center is um, so small that you have to refill it uh, quite often, actually. Now, I'm not sure if you're using coal um, as you're watching me. I use coal and I know I'm using one of those pencils uh, that they that you can buy nowadays uh, very easily. And I know that um, it, I can use it for months and months without it um, being finished. Um, so when you refill, when you fill up one of these containers, they will last quite a bit until, um, until they're, they need to be refilled. So I brought some of the objects for you to see. I'm not sure you can see it from, uh, but I'm trying to hold them up as well. Can you see my video? I hope you can. Anyway. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks. <laughs> so this is uh, one of the containers from, um, that's actually made out of a nut. Um, it's, uh, it's from Morocco. But the interesting thing is that there are people who say that the shape and the, um, and the container is actually from India. 
Now, I've not been able to confirm this, but I would be interested now that I'm speaking to people who are actually based in India. If you can confirm indeed that this is this, this could also be like a nut or um, um, a shape that you would recognize as being uh, from India, but we can talk about it later, that's fine. Um, I brought this one as well for you guys to see. This is one of the Yemeni silver, um, silver uh, bottles. Um, you can see that the needle is stuck to, the, to a small lid that you can take off and then dip it into uh, the coal and then actually uh, use it for your eyes. Um, and nowadays in our modern society, they also sell these things which are a modern variety of a, of a coal container. It's made out of plastic, but nevertheless uh, quite pleasant. And uh, if I use it, I use coal on a daily basis and I can, it will last me for about a year or so. So um, some of the con these containers are actually quite large, like these ones. Uh, these are like textile and beadwork and um, embroidered uh, from Egypt, Jordan and Palestine. Uh, and what is interesting here is that I believe that the coal container is um, comes from the realm, how do you say that, the domain of costume. It's like utilitarian and practical and it's used in homes, but it's also used as amulets and ceremonies. And they're actually, the containers are not that big. These, these are like uh, 20 centimeters uh, in length. But on the top, you can see the, the very small coal compartment um, this is like a, a small glass flask that is about five centimeters in height and uh, only one centimeter in, diam in diameter. So it's um, actually a very small compartment uh, in which the actual coal is stored, but they made them quite large. And that has to do, of course, that they're used in ceremonies. So some of these containers, these are the biggest ones I have seen yet. They're like 35 to 40 centimeters long and they're actually used to dance with uh, on weddings. Uh, so they are like ceremonial, they have a ceremonial function as well. Besides the fact that they're later on hung in houses and kept as house amulets and of course used to, to, uh, to decorate your, yourself. Um, so some of my conclusions from this research was that um, these contemporary coal containers that I've looked at were very personal objects and they display a certain spontaneity in the way in which they're made. So sometimes these containers were made by the people who use them themselves. So for instance, the textile ones and you know, the bright red one that you see here on this, uh, on this slide and the leather one you can see below that's decorated with the yellowish beadwork. Those are actually homemade, so to say, and they're often made of of, um, of pieces of textile or small shells that would come, that look like actually they've been used in a different setting and then were reused in the coal containers. But they're also the ones that are really made uh, specifically for the purpose, like the wooden one on the top left. And again, the nut that is on the lower left of the, of the slide. Um, the material, I think, of these coal containers actually puts them, points them into the domain of a certain area of, of a culture. So for instance, the um, textile ones belong to the domain of dress, whereas the, the silver ones belong to the domain of jewelry and therefore they're treated differently and they're made differently. Um, apart from that, they, their variation, the different types, different forms uh, vary through time. They're also vary through gender and they're also, of course, a cultural variation. So the gender one, I want to, um, I want to tell you something about the, the silver one on the top uh, right side of the page that has all the chains on it. This is actually one that's used um, uh, on the Arabian Peninsula. And this is, this is a coal container specifically designed for a man. So, uh, this is the only, actually, the only way that you can differentiate between gender in, um, in, uh, for these objects. And that is because uh, since the, um, uh, this is in the domain of jewelry and men were not supposed to wear jewelry, they made these coal containers in the shape of a bullet so that it would still be, you know, 
normal for a man to wear it. So this is an interesting aspect of, um, of the containers, I think. And um, with this, I'm guessing we can also look at, well, this is not something I've done yet, but something I'm working on. We can look at ancient coal containers and see, you know, try to make, uh, to, to understand why they were, um, they, they were, for instance, they gained so much in variation in the new kingdom and why they changed so much. Um, so I've not looked at the um, Indian continent yet. I did grab some pictures for you to show what they look like in, uh, in uh, India or in the Himalayas. Actually, the one that's uh, on the top right is one from the Himalayas. And um, it will be interesting to, un to see and to talk about this a little bit later if you've ever seen any of these objects yet. And um, of course, it would be interesting to study. It would be an interesting subject uh, maybe to explore with, uh, with your institute, Sonali, um, in the near future. Um, okay, off to hair. Uh, hair is a strange subject. It's ordinary and special at the same time. It's um, codified as well. It's intimate and it expresses identity very much. So I am looking at hair from the, of course, again, West Asian, North African region, the Wana region. Um, I've done so with the Ababda nomads in the Southeast of Egypt, but also in ancient Tel Amarna, which is in Middle Egypt. Now, um, first, I want to show you a little bit about uh, the Ababda women, the nomads. These are some images that were taken in the 1990s, I think, um, of above the women dancing and showing off their hair um, that would otherwise definitely be covered with their large body veils. But hair in these cases has a role in constructing social relations. It's shown and danced with. Um, I want to show you this image. It's um, a very rare image of a very elaborate hair hairstyle with tiny braids decorated with beads and gold sequins. And as you can see on the lower ends of their braids, they use huge wax lumps to keep the braid in place. And this is also what wears down the, the hairstyle. So whenever they are, um, uh, whenever they are dancing with this hair, because they weigh down their hair, it like swings very beautifully around their heads. So. Um, it has a, a different function from just uh, keeping the braids in place as well. So these hairstyles, I have tried to compare with, uh, with my work on ancient hairstyles, and I'm still in the process of doing so. Um, hair and hairdressing is a very social and, uh, and intimate, um, um, intimate, uh, um, how do you say that, um, act. Here you see uh, a picture of uh, Tuareg women dressing each other's hair and almost exactly the same image from a statue from ancient Egypt that I wanted to show you um, to express, you know, often you can't make a hairstyle like this in your own hair and you need somebody else to, to do it. So um, um, one of the things that um, an, a researcher, Keimer, has uh, done by the Beja people in the, the southeast of Egypt is he describes that they were dressing, the women were dressing their hair and it took hours for them to make, you know, to fix these tiny braids and to make the little lumps on the end, ends. So it's a very social gathering where people talk to each other all the time. Um, so an interesting situation. Apart from that, hairdressing often it occurs within the same gender group. So men dress the hair of men and women dress the hair of women. And um, it's not like free, you can, you do not, in, in these societies, you do not just go to a hairdresser and say whatever you like. Um, it's very much codified. So when you're an adult male and you live with the Beja, this is your hairstyle. Um, and you may or not may wear a large hairpin in your hair, but this is what you do and you do not, uh, you do not you, you know, do something else with your hair. Um, hair, therefore, very much expresses identity. It will tell you if a woman is married, if she's, um, if she's unmarried, what her social position is, what she does. And we can only assume that this was also the case in ancient times. 
So in Tel Al Amarna, in the middle of Egypt, I'm uh, studying hair uh, at a site from the 13th century BC. Uh, actually, it is the, um, it's the town in which Tutankhamun was born. And uh, this is what my um, research topic looks like. Mostly they're human remains and they have their hairstyle still uh, preserved intact often. So I'm looking at hairstyle of ancient citizens. And one of the unique things is that this is a site that shows you hair from ordinary people. So we're not looking at pharaohs and we're not looking at the Egyptian elite, but we're looking at normal men and women. So this is the hair style of a young girl and she's wearing a multitude of small braids. They're actually thicker already than the Bejao women, women that I just showed you. They were very tiny braids and these are slightly thicker, but they're still under a centimeter in diameter. So um, it will take a while to put them in. And many of the adult women that I've looked at, they wore extensions in braided or loose hair. And I took some of the extensions to show you. They're very small, so I had to really blow the image up. But um, on the top right, you can see a relief of a woman who is actually making one of these extensions. Uh, this is how the Egyptians depicted it. And um, uh, you can, see, I, as I found that sometimes women in Amarna wear over 90 extensions per individual. And I also found that they have different hair donors. So you, if you had very dark black hair, you might just as well wear lighter, lighter brown hair uh, as an extension in your own hairstyle. So um, this means that they used to have a significant trade in hair and hair pieces in ancient Egypt. And what is interesting, of course, to realize that this, that we're here looking at hairstyles that were not created by the people who wore these hairstyles. So there are how the dead were identified by the living, so to speak. So if you died, your next of kin would dress your hair and they would do so in a style, of course, that was uh, normal to the period, but it would also be like an ascribed identity. It would be an, um, an identity that uh, your um, next of kin would dress you with, so to speak. Um, now I'm looking in my research, of course, at the reason why um, these hairstyles were produced. Uh, if it has anything to do with religious convictions or so, but I'm also looking at technology. So this actually looks like a large broomstick, but that's because it's like, a, it's a picture of hair that was magnified. So it's actually very small. And you can see in the, the centimeter and the scale that I put in what, what one centimeter is. So they're very tiny, very tiny extensions and they were made by wrapping tresses of hair with other hair strands. Um, and then of course they were dressed into the hair as you can see in the uh, small uh, sculpture that I put in. Um, this is a very nicely made, also quite enlarged um, extension with, uh, with an extension bulb. This is the, the top, the bulb of the hair extension. And this is the wrap where they've wrapped uh, small strands of hair around uh, the other hair in the extension. And you can see here, there's a small braid protruding from the top. And this is what they used for knotting or braiding these uh, small braids in, these extensions into your hair. So they fixated them with small, uh, tiny braids. Now these braids are less than two millimeters in, um, uh, in diameter. So very small, almost used as a sort of string. And this chaos, is a detailed image of hair. And I hope I can indicate this with this arrow still. This is the, um, uh, this is the extension bulb and here's another one. And this is the small braid that is used to tie it into the original hair. And you can see here that the extension is used in, the, uh, in another braid that is being made. Um, considering the fact that these people sometimes wore over 90 extensions, um, you must realize that when a person died in this town in ancient Egypt, um, 
it took quite a while before this hairstyle would be completely you know fixed and ready and from evidence that we're looking at we're now assuming that they were dressed after death so they try to prepare this in in their own you know in their own religious system now it's interesting that dressing hair can also be considered an act of remembrance and mourning um, for people um, and this was done of course after death in preparation of the burial so you see here an image uh, on the left a statue of a man uh, with an elaborate egyptian hairstyle on the inset two of the uh, hairs that i'm two of the heads that i'm working on the individuals and um well, a morning scene below that. So um, yes, dressing hair as part of a morning ritual is um, an interesting consideration, I think. Um, there are also other things found that relate to hair. So for instance, um, these mirrors, you can see in the larger picture here, a bronze mirror that's lying in one of the graves and some hair pieces, loose hair, strands that are uh, buried with it and in the inset on the left i've uh, showed you what these mirror looked like and here is um on the right is like a knife that is used as a razor blade so mirrors hair pieces and tools for hairdressing they were buried with the dead and they were symbols and very powerful instruments of ensuring rebirth in ancient egypt so for all sorts of reason it's connected to religion uh, the fact that you have to have this elaborate hairstyle. Um, there's a, some sort of um, 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 an allergy with uh, an sorry an um, allergy with uh, uh, traditional um, hairstyles in East Africa, for instance here with uh, beja. There are also modern symbols uh, and tools in hairdressing that have uh, a religious or a political base. For instance, these combs. Um, these combs were used by men and they are worn with a certain pride and it's, it shows a sort of richness to be wearing this into your hair and a very interesting study if you're ever interested in, uh, in the meaning of hair of African combs then this is an interesting book. Uh, it shows you, it's not my book, but it's, uh, it shows uh, 6,000 years of uh, culture, politics and identity. Um, of why you would wear certain um, certain combs and when on what occasions or it's interesting uh, it's an interesting read I think um, now for the face veil project I've recently started writing up my research um, so this will be a next publication uh, hopefully um, on veils like this from the region now, face veils are very everyday garments, and they were highly personal and, of course, very intimate since they are actually completely to your face. And what is interesting and central for my research is they are they move our senses. And you can, I'm trying to stay away from all political and religious connotation of these veils. I'm trying to focus only on what do you see, what do you hear, what do you feel, what do you smell from these veils when you're wearing it and when you are. A spectator and you're looking at people who wear it how do they move your senses that is what i want to uh, convey with this book now veils um, they can be associated for their connection to the body women uh, wear their personal wealth uh, strapped to their veil making this very heavily but almost jewelry items as you can see here in a veil from north sinai where a woman is, uh, is completely covered with, uh, with this very thin, very thin veil that's covered with coins. And this is actually very uh, common in the Sinai in Egypt and in Pal the Palestinian region and Syrian region. This is what women wear there as face veil. Um, and a lot of these veils have coins in sequence, which might look easy because it will tell you uh, often something about a date and about the authenticity of a veil or economic value that women you know, display their, their value in the society with their veils. But it's also very difficult because some of these coins, I found veils with Roman 
Greek, Greco-Roman coins soon onto them. And of course, they're not from that time period. But um, it still, it still is an interesting, uh, an interesting feature that all these sequins and coins could possibly be dated. Um, what it, apart from dates, also shows a very interesting cultural hybridity of these people. Um, as you can see here, it's an Israeli coin worn on um, a Palestinian um, face veil, and they show the trade contacts between these Bedouin groups who wear these veils. It's, uh, it's very interesting to study them and uh, very time consuming as well. Um, many of these textiles are very multi-layered. So they have, they have a lining, they have um, a textile that is, that is the main textile of the face cover and then they have decoration added to it. So this, what you're looking at here, is a Rashida veil from the southeast of Egypt um, and northern Sudan, actually, also. And these people wear one of the heaviest veils in the region. And it's about one and a half kilogram that this woman is wearing on her face <laughs> almost uh, constantly. Um, so these are very impressive uh, objects. And Again, many coins and amulets stung to it, uh, hung to it. And um, on the lower part, you can see metal beadwork that is uh, metal woven beadwork that is decorating this, uh, this veil. Something completely different is, uh, is this. This is from Oman, a face veil, the Omani Batula. It's, I think, one of the most interesting veils around. It is shaped to fit the individual completely so you can see women argue on the marketplace uh, what it will look like for them and what they want to accentuate in their face and what do they want to hide so um, it's a very much fills up their personal um, and individual needs and it's also um, it's said that they don't take the veil off unless they they go to sleep so um, uh, these are very um, how do you say that? Very loved in the in, in Oman. They're made of silk. Their silk is dyed with indigo. And this uh, completely stains your skin when you wear it, but this is also considered beautiful. And as you can see from the picture on the right, the veil is very shiny, and that's because they polish it. They polish the silk uh, with a small stone, the pebble, which makes it shine up very nicely. Now, I've brought one of these veils to show to you today. Um, I hope you can see it. This is, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, on the other side, you can see the indigo stains um, that are made like a beautiful. And the, the funny thing is that the silk is reinforced with, uh, with a tape um, like uh, that's used for, that painters use, I guess, or, uh, when you paint your house, you, you put on your wood not to stain it with uh, paint. And this is why they reinforced, you can see the strips, uh, the strips of the tape sitting here. And um, well, this is how you wear it, I guess. And of course, after that, you completely um, purple and blue from the indigo, but they also wear a small one like this. It's like, um, a tiny one also reinforced uh, on the other side with the tape. Um, and they strap it with these strings around their, around their faces. Um, I think this is one of the most interesting uh, uh, veils because it's so completely different from the others. And it has an entire rich tradition of polishing the cloth and then also getting these stains on your face uh, and showing if you take it off that you've wore it. Um, so there's a complete life behind this, uh, behind this veil. Now, as I just showed you in the Omani veils, there are like strings attached, very long one in this case, by which you can wrap it around your he head or fixate it. Um, so you have to pull it for it to, to stay to your face like this. And then I guess you have this long, uh, this long cord here, hanging here. Um, so this is what it would look like. Um, but what you see on the, um, uh, on the slide here is a different ways of tying veils. 
And in my research, I'm now, I've now begun to document these different ways and what people, what solution women came up with to, um, to accommodate, uh, to, you know, to facilitate this, this, uh, this tying or wearing this veil constantly. Um, it had to be tight. It couldn't, you know, you, you don't, have, you can't have it that it will uh, that will blow, that it will blow up in desert winds. Or you have to tie it really tightly. And um, I think it's interesting to see what different techniques women are using. Um, so I'm making images like this of um, thread and and uh, and wire by by which they are they are. Um, tying these veils and well I can show you one other I guess one other image or one other veil sorry like this one this is a Saudi veil and this is actually has leather thongs stuck on the on the top of the veil too I don't know I don't know how they connected this I'm still looking at this one how to do it how to use it but um, as you can see, there's a large variety there. Now, these veils have been used very intensively. And one of the projects that I'm working on is I'm writing a grant to research the smell, the scent of these veils. So many, uh, in many countries, it's a tradition to, to use incense to perfume your veil or to perfume your clothes and jewelry. Um, and that's why many of these veils actually have a very a distinct scent and I'm working with an English person to um, English scholar who has uh, recently written a PhD on the scent of heritage to document uh, to document the different scents here uh, now each veil also makes a sound so I'm documenting um, the sound of each particular veil I didn't bring any veil I think that actually rattles but because of the coins chain stones and the glass beads these things jingle all the time. So I'm assuming that any person um, that you would recognize a person from the specific sound that one's fail made. So I think this is an interesting, um, this is an interesting addition to these uh, objects. They're very complex objects. They have a very distinct visual appeal. I'm not sure if you like them. I would like to hear if you guys like them. I really think they're beautiful. They are a bit naive in a way they are made um, they are spontaneous. They've added objects to them um, that they found. I will show you later. Um, and one of the things that I'm looking at, one of the, one of the ways I'm, I'm studying these documents is like there's like a trend in textile research that says slow looking, which I like because, uh, because of, the, of course, the connection to slow cooking <laughs> but slow looking at textiles means that you really zoom into the details really look focus on the condition of the garment describe associations that you might have as a researcher um, they are very well they are very um, contrastful garments with um, hard surfaces uneven patchy surfaces beading embroidery so there's a lot to see in these garments. And if you really take the time, you will notice details and things that are very interesting and will tell you a lot of things about the person who wore it. Because uh, though um, um, they often personalized these garments, made them into you know, um, um, their, specific, um, their specific strap to wear around their heads, their headbands, because these were the things that you know, um, that they had to wear all day. So there are different ideas and beliefs and religious and fears that they're actually reflected in these garments. This is a face veil with an amulet. Um, and it's an interesting amulet, as you can see here in the circle. I, I've, this is a detailed picture and you can see a small, um, a small piece of wood going over the veil and it's used um, to um, keep the veil, prevent the veil from, um, you know, getting lifted um, in the desert winds. And you often see this in, uh, in veils that they've tried to, to, um, to weigh them down, to make them heavier. And of course, these amulets, I have no idea, no clue what they were used for or why they were attached to these veils, but um, 
it's interesting to think that it has to do with a person's fear of with a person's um, personal beliefs. They often wear, use perforated stones uh, to weigh the veils down. And uh, I get the impression that it often has to do with a certain, um, um, well, spontaneously found objects in the desert that they thought were appropriate or they, um, they um, attached to these veils, like objet trouvé, um, things they found in the desert and they thought were um, you know, of use to them. I really like that very individual aspect of, uh, of these objects. Sometimes they're astonished, like for instance, this um, veil, which has a military tag from the First World War hanging on it with uh, mentioning the name of the soldier that wore it, this registration number and his religious conviction. Um, I, ha I haven't looked into it yet, but it would be an interesting search to find out um, who the tag originally belonged to. And this is on a North Sinai veil from Egypt. Sometimes it's easy to document, it's easier to, uh, sorry, to date a veil by the beads that are strung to it than it is by the coins. For instance, this one, this has a very specific plastic bead uh, used in the decoration, confetti lucite beads that were made in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, and this is actually much, um, this actually says a lot more about the date of this veil than any of the coins with dates on it, because there uh, seems to be very old coins uh, attached to it that um, do not really help. But this, uh, these beads are really in the construction of the veil and I'm sure were used, um, were used or, or attached in that time period. Now these veils, they are like a combination, like a patchwork um, of different textiles. Um, and they were adjusted, of course, to the personal taste of the wearer because it has to be somehow comforting to wear it. So the construction techniques and the textiles um, and all alteration and signs of wear, um, they're interesting to note down and write down before when you're studying these objects. So it tells you a lot about the personal choice. Now, this is the back of one of the veils. It shows a very noticeable slit that I've never seen before in, in down the center of this veil. Um, beautiful bright colors that were used on the inside. This is what the person who owned this veil would have constantly felt on her face. Um, on the outside, the garment shows a lot of signs of stress and wear, um, specifically where the coins abraded the cloth. And you can see in the next picture, a more detailed image of how these coins actually affect the, the, the conservation of the textiles. Um, also, some of the coins show a layer of dirt or traces of corrosion which are interesting to, um, to uh, study and understand what happened to this object. And this, on this specific um, Saudi veil, you can see that salt mineral patina that completely came through it. Um, I'm assuming that it's um, because, of the, um, because of sweat of the owner. Repairs show that these garments were really treasured and um, well, that they were used for many, many years and that they, uh, that they also wish to maintain them and uh, for a successive life, so to speak. Now, this is uh, my final example that I wanted to show you. This is um, a veil from Egypt, a large black veil that's very see-through, lacy, transparent uh, veil, but it has this huge um, golden um, or gilded, um, amulet on the nose of the wearer. This is a called an arusa, and in Arabic that literally translates as the bride, so the bride of the veil or the doll of the veil. And these, uh, these uh, veils were worn until the 1950s in Egypt, and then they completely disappeared. So what happened there? Um, the interesting thing is that this uh, veil type was probably worn for a century or more. We have like there's like textual evidence that it was worn for a hundred years at least. Um, it's right at the moment that the Egyptian women's right movement started in the 1930s. 
these veils were, were abandoned mostly. And by the time it was 1950, almost nobody wore, this, uh, wore these clothes anymore. And by the time I got to study them in the early 2000s, the Arusas, the Arusas could only be found on art antique markets. So for instance, you would see this in Egypt on the marketplace where you could buy a, a old silver and all sorts of objects and you would see an Arusa lying, lying there. Um, I collected quite a bit of them. And this is on the left, a rare example of the cloth of the veil still in place with the Arusa attached to it. But most of the Arusas are found loose, like loose dress elements. Um, and they're um, the amulets that were worn on the inside. So the text, they were, there were small tubes in which they could put pieces of text. Um, I've never found any text in one of them that I collected. So I'm not even sure if it ever had one, but from text, um, from research that was done on them, I believe that they used to contain uh, textual amulets. Um, but they were removed most of the time. So this is the only thing you found. So what is interesting here is that um, in around, let's say 20 to 30 years, the veil and the object was completely um, um, abandoned. Nobody wore this, this type of dress anymore. And then even half a century later, nobody knew what it was for. So I had to ask around uh, many to, I asked many people, what is this? Do you still remember what this is? And most of them said, no, I don't really know. So you can see how quickly this goes with the tradition um, that it will take up to, well, in half a century or two generations, nobody will remember anymore what these veils were, um, were used for or what these objects were used for. Anyway, um, this is what I wanted to tell you. Um, I've done some um, contextual research, in this case, advertisement uh, uh, on these arusas. And as you can see on this can, which was used, I think um, it contained oil um, in which you could, you can fry your food. And you can see that they used a picture of a woman uh, wearing an arusa and one of the transparent veils. So it's used in association with uh, traditions and quality, you know, to define um, the inside of the can. But that's about it. That is, um, that is what remains of the Arusa in Egypt. Um, so if you want to know more about my work or you can also visit the Wearable Heritage website and follow me on Facebook and Instagram. And um, well, over to Sonali, I guess, for... Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful talk. And Welcome. Perhaps, perhaps at this time you can unshare the screen. Yes. And uh, if, uh, uh, you know, this was such, so uh, amazing to see uh, the kind of details you've gone into to understand um, things that, that, that have eluded you and the, the continuous traditions uh, that you see, you know, coming down from pharaonic times till now, this is just amazing. And this just goes on to tell us that identity is so important. Why yes. do we stick on to certain aspects of materiality? Why do we leave something like it's so ingrained in us? And uh, the example of the Arusa that how, uh, you know, something like this can just vanish, you know, in a decade or two decades like that, you know? So yeah. that's amazing. And while you were talking, I had to go to my closet and get something. <laughs> <laughs> I had got this from uh, Cairo and my doll with, yes. uh, you know, let's see what lies below yep. the veil. <laughs> <laughs> so this, everyone, is my doll with the veil that um, Yolanda talked about. And of course, you know, during the times of Corona, especially, you know, and what you talked about, the veils particularly hit me. Like each one of us, even the men, now know what it feels to it have feels a muffled voice yes. to see behind a mask. And Ooh, these women, funny. you know, so, so, you know, like they say necessity is the mother of invention. So a lot of these things that you talked about of weighing it down, of the wind, you know, like it's so hot inside. So, and we see the kind of variation being um, made in these masks that are produced. They suddenly have started matching our outfits, 
you know exactly. yeah <laughs> earlier they were so ugly like the ones that you find you know in hospitals but now there's a variation uh somebody who is a lawyer is wearing a very different kind of mask compared to somebody uh, like you and me or like a kid so classification and uh, artifact categories and uh, this is very important to archaeologists and the way you have approached it is amazing because that's how it needs to be done and anthropologically mm -hmm. yeah. is very important because it gives you insight and that's why your publishing house is <laughs> <laughs> exactly well, thanks Manali. thank you yeah yeah so thank could you, you by the way I, I was wondering, could you actually see, you can also see me talk, right? So you could see the, the sorry, the, um, the veils that I was showing you. Of course, we could yeah, see okay, you yeah. and the veils. Yeah. And it's really sad the way Zoom is that you can't really see your audience, but now you yeah. can. So uh, I'd I'll urge uh, all those who want to ask questions, please raise your hands. I saw that there were a lot of things in the chat already. Okay, so we have Manan. Manan, please uh, over to you on the mic. and. Uh, for those of you who do not know you, Manan, please introduce yourself as well, briefly. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah. So, hi, Alanda. Uh, I First, I would like to say it was a very brilliant and one of the most unique uh, uh, topics or uh, talks I've heard till date. Thank you. Uh, to give a brief uh, introduction, uh, self-introduction, I am a biochemist and uh, my interest in archaeology is merely, it was a hobby and I was curious about it and I just accident, uh, I just happened to meet Sonali over the online forum and I've been uh, associated with this talk since then. Uh, given this unique uh, talk, I have quite a few questions. If it's okay with Sonali, I can can I ask all of them oh, please, right away? Please, yeah. and that uh, in the meantime, those yeah. who so want I have quite to... a few of them. Yeah, yeah, surely go ahead with that. And in the meantime, others who want to raise their hands, please do it, and please mull over the questions you want to ask. Yeah, so uh, my first question, it's not directly related to your talk, but uh, it's more out of curiosity that uh, while you were speaking about uh, your work and experience with the uh, East and with the African nations, yeah. uh, would tribal or ritual, uh, ritualistic uh, uh, masks, which is often uh, seen in African tribes, can they be considered as a variable heritage or uh, is there any uh, such importance or significance associated with them as you've described for different veils and uh, different uh, textiles or jewelry that is uh, worn by other people? Um, are you asking me, um, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing if I understood you correctly. Um, are you asking about African masks, like wooden masks or? Oh um... uh, yes, the tribal masks. Uh... That's what you're talking about, right? But also about jewelry or? Um... No, just the, uh, just the masks. Uh, like in different uh, African tribes, they have their unique masks, which yes. they use for different uh, rituals or different uh, occasions. So, can they be considered as a variable herit heritage? Yes, or? yes, I would consider them wearable heritage, but that's also because my definition of wearable heritage is broader than just um, dress or you know costume elements. I would, for instance, also consider um, weapons that uh, that are worn mm -hmm. on the body uh, wearable heritage. So yes, definitely, I would consider the wooden mask uh, to be uh, part of that uh, category. Uh, Great. Now, my second question is, uh, during your studies, uh, were you able to do any osteological analysis of work in order to trace the origins of veils or the use of coals? So as you had mentioned, uh, they used galena, or basically that is lead sulfide. Yes. Uh, repeated use of lead sulfide does lead to uh, or does have an impact on the collagen structure of the bones. 
so or if you are if the people are wearing veils weighing up to 1 kg or 1 kilo it is going to have an impact on the bones so were you uh, able to do any osteological analysis or such to trace the origins unfortunately not um it is only uh, osteoanalysis is done in the excavation of amarna um and there i'm working with a much larger team um uh, who are studying the bones but that's just to get a background to the hairstyles for me at least it is um i have not done any work or not been able to done any work to do any work on um on what the effect of wearing a heavy veil is i haven't actually talked to any people about it either so um the thing that would be nice and interesting to do is um to do some sort of um anthropological work among the rashida for instance who wear these heavy veils um and the other thing you were saying about uh, galena um the letzel fight there are quite some researchers who um looked into the question of whether or not this is healthy or very bad for your health to wear um this kind of uh, this kind of coal and although um you would think that lead sulfide is really bad for your health and of course if you use it in the large quantities um it is it is still found that uh, the that what it does to your skin the chemical reaction that the um, lead sulfide um uh, gives to the skin has um uh, um infection repellent um effect so I've actually I I I have a whole section in my book on coal containers about this subject because it is so it's a much discussed uh it's a much discussed subject because the lead sulfide right. is still in many of the coal recipes that are used today as well. On the other hand, I looked at the contents of this um, modern coal flask at the content description and it doesn't it doesn't sound all healthy that <laughs> that that it's that the ingredients uh, the ingredients that are in here so um yeah i'm not sure if it's uh, if it's bad for your health does that and, answer your uh, one final question ah <clears throat> uh, yes th it does thank you uh, just mm -hmm. one last final question uh you had mentioned about the uh, use of different materials like uh, coins or glasses or uh, glass or stones being used in veils and you do plan to uh, look into the different sounds that they produce uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that and what would be the significance of specifically uh, looking into the different sounds made by these materials uh, how it would help identify uh, an individual and Okay uh, this is again I'm uh, just uh, assuming that it's quite possible to mix match material uh, like uh, two entirely different people could have a similar combination of materials so how do you then distinguish uh, okay between... it's not so much I'm not so much interested in being able to distinguish um from sound for instance what kind of materials were used in the veils what I'm interested in is do you know how you um um if you're if you're sitting in your room and you hear your 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 spouse or a good friend approach you can hear by the sound of a pe person walking that that person is going to enter the room um right well it's a, it's similar to that i'm interested i'm interested in the individual sounds that these uh, garments make so would you be able for instance would a child in the middle of the desert be able to recognize his mother by the sound her veil makes so i'm only in, that's i'm only interested in documenting these sounds for that reason so um it doesn't have um it doesn't have a very scientific um idea behind it to, and you know to be able to um to identify materials it would just be for the individuality of for the the highly person uh, highly personalized um sound these objects make that's all i want to uh, that's all i want to uh, to stress with this research and i want to add to okay. that uh, you know often times uh, in the department i would wear my uh, skirt with a jingling bell and uh, everybody would say we always know when sonali is yeah. approaching 
you know, because uh, uh, it's the sound gives away. And it's, again, that's what we were all talking about today, nonverbal engagement. Yes. Uh, in Egypt, for example, in a society where, where the women are very insulated, you know, from everything. Uh, how do they talk? How do they let themselves known? So this is almost like a struggle of muffled voices, right? Of mm -hmm. wanting to be known through agency yes. of materiality. Yes, exactly. And it's amazing how they innovate to be known, to be heard without speaking. Yes. And that's the beauty. On a very personal level as well. On a very personal level. Yeah. And um, uh, with the Abab does, uh, you know, you were showing the women when they let their hair loose. I also have a clip when I was there where they, you know, with their backs turned and their hair were moving like that to woo the men. You know, and ordinarily they would never show their hair, but how hair is used to seduce. Yes. Can you yeah. share the clip uh, uh, later on your page? It would be yes, nice. Yes, yes. I, I, I have the series of Egypt, my uh, yes, travels in Egypt. I'll put it on there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm just so fascinated by the work that you're doing. And like rightly said, uh, what Manan said, that it's so unique. It's so unique and it needs to be known in this part of the world too. Nice. Yeah. Have you ever, did you, have you uh, ever thank encountered? Thank you for the, sorry. Oh, no, no, please carry on. No, I was just wondering if, um, because I showed you the bronze uh, coal containers from, um, from India, from the Himalayas and, um, and broader India. <laughs> have you ever seen any of these objects before? Uh, I have seen coal containers. I was particularly like, um, you know, the one with the uh, camel. Uh, was yes. that from the Himalayas as well? Mm, it said Bactrian. Bactrian. So I would wonder because, you know, the Bactrian camels are double humped. Two humped mm -hmm. camels. But this one had just one hump. And there was a bird on top of it. It's very interesting. <laughs> it would be very interesting to see where is this coming from. And um, yeah. Yeah, you need to come to the institute yes. <laughs> to start working on Himalayan gear, you know, Himalayan, yes. like, you know, uh, for those of you um, who work in the Himalayas, you know, the Himalayan topis, uh, every district, uh, the cats, every district has its own, um, um, like Malana has a white one, Kinnor has a green one. Yeah. And then even in Uttarakhand, they wear the green one, which shows association of that region with uh, the Kinnor Shimla belt because of a deity called Mahasu. So, but also these caps were not worn before. Like if you see photographs of the early, uh, mid eight, uh, you know, 19th century, uh, mm -hmm. they were wearing very plain hats. So this came much after. So it's not like a continuous tradition. Things change, things continue. So yes. why do they change? What what are the things that impact these changes or continuance is very important for us to see. And it goes very quickly often. Within a few generations or within a generation, things can be different. Yeah. So the fading in, the fading yeah. out, and uh, in between lies yes. the hidden and the revealed. <laughs> okay. Okay. Manan, you have more questions? Uh, no, no. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Manan, for your, um, your questions. Thanks. So our next question is from Dr. Vijay Lakshmi Bose. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you for a very fascinating uh, <clears throat> talk. It was absolutely yeah. fascinating. As, uh, as this platform knows, I'm a dilettante. I'm not really... I belong to a completely different profession, but mm -hmm. I've learned so much and I enjoy it so much that I, I'm a very frequent uh, visitor. Nice. So um, <clears throat> just to say that I'm from Bengal originally, okay. and uh, one of the containers you showed, the silver one, I have one in my family. It was like my great grandmother's. These ones? This, this one? one, yes. This one is actually for ether, for perfume. Without the top uh, stick, it doesn't have the top stick. It has a little handle and you flip yeah. it and you put your little 
perfume inside. Okay. So you use the little bit of perfume, but the other one, the conical one. Oh yes, the black one. conical one. This yep. one. Yeah, I have one of silver filigree. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, and that's a cold cold container nice. because the, and also yeah. Yeah, you were saying? No, 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 go ahead. And uh, if I can share my screen, Sonali, can I share my screen? Of course. Okay, can you see this on my screen? Mm, I can see it, but... It's a cold container. I think you need yeah. to share it. Uh, uh, you need Maybe to I'm share it. You need more. to click on it. What? Um, share screen. Huh, here we and go. Can you timer. see it now? Uh, just a minute. It takes a while, I guess. Yeah, it's blank right now. Yeah, well, now. that's a cold container, and it has a very specific function. It's carried oh, by the bride on her wedding day. Okay. Oh, yes. It's uh, made out of silver, and if you can't afford silver, then you it's made out of metal. So you have to carry, if you're a traditional Bengali bride, you have to carry it on your wedding day. Is it very small? It is very small. Yes, but it's it can literally be fits. The handle fits into the palm of your hand and the two cones jut out and you can see that uh, you can uh, hinge. It's on a hinge. So mm -hmm. here's the container. If you can see my cursor. Yes, yes. I can this see. is where, the little uh, hollow container where you put the kajul actually. And uh, it's a part of the wedding ensemble. It still is. Very If you nice. have a traditional wedding. Yes. It's part of the wedding ensemble. Very nice. Uh, so I don't, it's, I tried to look up why it's carried there, but it says that um, it's part of uh, generally the auspiciousness of the occasion. Yeah. Uh, okay. Also cool, uh, until the no, pediatrician stopped it very recently, about 10 years ago, used to be made of lamp black at home. Yeah. So you actually bought a little silver or a brass lamp if you couldn't afford silver. And uh, you put uh, clarified butter and you collected the lamp black and you applied it uh, on children. And interestingly enough, it's also used to ward off the evil eye. Yes. So if I wear it in a certain part of my body, especially on the forehead, it's to ward off the evil eye for children. You see, it's interesting how India has an entire, uh, I mean, it's very similar in a way to the um, um, West Asian, North African region in the sense that they also ward off the evil eye with coal and it's for magical protection often. Um, but uh, I feel it's like it has like this, uh, this this uh, it's like slightly different in India and what you do with it because one of the containers that you just showed I would never have identified it as a coal container because I believe that um, the Indian ones often have other colors um, in them by which they they add makeup or um, um, you know like body makeup or uh, other um, other in other body colors. makeup was usually pots body makeup was usually pots out of uh, crystal uh, in different ages. It went from wood to bronze to okay. crystal to silver, depending yeah. on what the cultural uh, traditions. But coal was always, and coal for us is not powder. Powdered coal is surma, surma which has yes. a very different container. You you showed us a surma container. Well, yeah, you showed us a surma container. I guess so. Surma is uh, and and coal. So how do you apply coal then? Is it uh, is it like a liquid? Does it have like um? It's uh, it's not. It's kind of gel. It's because okay, it's got yes. uh, clarified butter in it. It's gel. It applies very smoothly. And okay. coal uh, and surma is powdered. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and it's applied. Vibhaji is right. It's applied with the finger. So is coal. But so this is all applied with the finger. You said you have one of these, right? And, and yeah, but that's thing. for that's not for coal. It doesn't no. have the stick, so I'm guessing it's not for coal. Mm -hmm. It's my okay. mother used to put a little bit, a very small bottle of I think it was evening in Paris or some such very expensive perfume. 
a little blue bottle I remember in the middle of this. Okay, because this is a very small one. And it's made out yes. of a it's made out of a typical Yemeni bead that's used in bride jewelry, in <coughs> wedding jewelry. <laughs> and this this uh, this bead is then uh, it's usually a hollow silver bead and it is then adapted to a coal container so it's interesting that it's also that you also find it in india i think yeah it's very it's very interesting yeah. to study how these customs yeah. actually traveled because yeah. there was this was you know way before internet or jet travel yes exactly and these very ones and these ones are very popular in Morocco specifically. I have never seen one. It's not used in Egypt. It's not used in between. It's only in Morocco. And then you say India. And uh, I've also heard that they're Indian containers and that they're that are um, uh, reused in Morocco for the purpose. So I very much very like awesome. your, yes. Thank you very much for your. Uh, Thank you very much. That was addition. a fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. And also the. Uh, like uh, coal and surma, uh, they protect your eyes from the sun, right? Mm -hmm. Nowadays, when we see these football players with those mm -hmm. marks, you know, you know, <laughs> warriors with those marks, and yeah. I, I use a blue one. I feel it accentuates the eyes. I, I just love the blue mm -hmm. one. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. I wonder if the Egyptians were wearing anything blue as well, because Definitely. I, yeah, because I, they used a lot of. Um, lapis in representations right mm -hmm. uh, yes uh, they used them um, they used them um, um, a copper oxide for mostly apart from the lead sulfide they used the copper oxide for their um, for their coal for the coal i don't think in the in the in the present i've never seen it but definitely in ancient egypt they wore this okay, okay. Uh, yolanda one of our uh, friends and mentor dr anjali still braids her hair with uh, uh, some artifacts that she got from Gujarat. So hair is still uh, is uh, ornaments are still used in the in the hair. I remember yeah. my mother using uh, uh, things uh, for to braid her hair with. She had a net which she would wear over her bun, and that mm -hmm. it had tiny gold stars on it. <laughs> and then she would use something that resembled a Western hat pin. To keep her bun, bun in place, and one was had a little diamond in it, and one uh, had a little gold flower on it. So uh, yes, I mean I still remember hair decorations. Of course, nowadays they wear it only if you have a traditional wedding or something. But mm, yes, yeah. people who had long hair used to braid their hair with tassels, and they still do. It's still considered ornamentation. And I have <laughs> one with filigree work for you know the bun i uh, it's very fine and uh, you just kind of it's like a flower shaped thing and you put it and you you know hold your bun together lovely and my mother used to use it as a weapon as well oh <laughs> to stick it to us if we were naughty <laughs> <laughs> very effective i'm assuming <laughs> well, of course they were very the sharp wretched things like daggers <laughs> It's <laughs> lovely. Yeah. Well, uh, Jolanda, one question that I have is what about uh, tattoos? I, you know, the Ababda women have tattoos all over. Uh, so, are you uh, looking into tattoos as adornments too? Um, I would love to, but I haven't just haven't gotten around to doing that. Mm -hmm. no. So, but it's definitely interesting. And it's interesting because, you know, it speaks of identity, permanent identity tattooing yes. and also representation of the self. Yeah. Yes. And uh, their idea of beauty, not our idea of beauty, their idea of beauty. Yes. Yeah. And but that's actually also the case, I think, with the Omani veils, um, because many people think, think they're hideous and I really like them, but they seem to really like them. You know, it, that's uh, these, um, I mean, these ones. Um, Mm -hmm. these masks that they wear I really like them and well obviously in Oman they're very popular still are they still are um, okay. yes they still are very popular and they make them in um, they make them with small sequins and really shiny colors and you can see here that the indigo is really uh, really impressive too yeah yeah shine. and I have to share this uh, 
you know, I had this um, uh, uh, woman archaeologist, Nehla, who used to yeah. work with me. And she invited me for dinner. And when I went to her place, and she would always have, you know, this kind of covered. And uh -huh. when I went, um, this man opened the door and there was a lady there. And uh, I was like, am I in Nehla's house? I said, yeah. I said, where's Nehla? And she said, that's Nehla. And she had this beautiful hair. And um, I had never seen her without her, you know, garb. And I was so shocked because I couldn't recognize her. It's totally different. So again, representation to the outside world and the inside world and navigating the two, you know, a change in identity with, uh, you know, veiled women is something so uh, deep and profound and with meaning. Yes, yeah. and I also like um, like the practicality of it. For instance, um, um, people from the Sinai who wear um, these veils that I showed you with all the coins, they can actually put their veils up. They can turn them upside down and, and flop them over their heads so they can eat and drink normally. But there are other veils, like the Saudi veils. They are so rigid that you can't really, you can do nothing. You can't do anything with these veils on your face. So... Mm -hmm. This has a completely different uh, way of dealing with these textiles as well. Right. And so and, yeah. these ones, you can't really move. So if it's stuck to your face, it's, you can't pull it up. It's made out of one piece of textile. Mm -hmm. So um, I always think that's different of how women um, respond or what they can do with, when they're wearing a veil. And that, and do these coins and all talk about like how rich these people are also? Yes, yes. Yeah. And yeah, uh, at times of drought or at times of need, they can kind they of can go away. It. Yeah. Because in Ladakh, you know, uh, there's a tribe which has this elaborate headdresses with uh, um, uh, turquoise and that's mm -hmm. like, uh, and different kind of stones. Yes, I know. And it. Uh, if it's totally filled, so, you know, they, they haven't had a moment of the stress, but if it kind of gets, um, less less and less you know that they're facing difficult times and that's yeah. like the money that comes into use and actually uh, i think i think all uh, all arabic um um jewelry from the area is sometimes used and remelted and remade into different jewelry items so this goes for coins that are on veils but also for rings and and uh, bracelets so yeah. And, you know, a very interesting tradition in India, you know, in marriages, uh, garlands are exchanged. I don't know if they still do it, but I have seen it happening with the uh, uh, paper notes all around. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nice. called the naksh, naksh, you know, so it's yeah. exchanged. And even okay. the uh, Bedouins, the Banjaras or the uh, Gypsies, on their skirts, yes. they have these coins, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So. Yes. Uh, I can surely say that with the uh, um, gypsies, uh, you know, they have had a lot of movement, you know, from Romania, India, all, all in between. Egypt, as, and well. Egypt yeah. as well. So the coins would have been exchanged, but it's, this is such a fascinating topic. And, you know, I was just thinking that, you know, whenever I go out, you know, um, being women, we just love dressing up, you know, don't we yes. all? So with my mask, you know, I love wearing my black mask, which has a Tibetan script on it. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, nobody's going to see who I am, but <laughs> I want to, I do want to project what I like, non-verbal engagement again, that, okay, I love the Himalayas. This is something Tibetan. If I wear this mask, you know, I'm speaking a little bit about myself and that's so important yes. to me. Yes. You know? And when I couldn't find my uh, black one, I had that uh, hideous blue one. I didn't want to go out. <laughs> I was like, no, I cannot be seen this like this. Okay. No, but it is, it is true that in a way, the veil, if you're wearing a veil, it causes you to be anonymous. So you're anonymous, but at the same time, you're expressing identity, you know, whether your group identity or you in, in you say I'm wearing this because I like it and I like to express something of myself so this is a very um this is a very interesting aspect of wearing veils it draws you into anonymity on the one hand and on the other hand it expresses your specific identity exactly so yeah. we have a, a question from Dr. Vibha Joshi uh Vibha ji your turn <laughs> 
I've even forgotten what I had in my mind, but I just, oh. <laughs> yeah, was, that conversation is going on and on. Oh, yeah, but yeah, I think I've been writing in the chat, probably irritating a lot of people with the pop-ups, but <laughs> yeah, well, forgets that the pop -ups. Off, so I'm, I'm only now seeing yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, very interesting. Yeah. Really. Thank you, Sonali, for arranging and getting you to talk to us. And I looked up your web page, which had, you know, <laughs> any yeah. articles Good. in the meanwhile, while you were talking. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, because um, I've been sort of attending a lot of textile um, uh, conferences and other things. Uh -huh. So uh, what I have also come across is uh, the Miao. Um, Miao. Meao women yeah. of this uh, southern Chinese, you know, mm -hmm. um, yes. islands and all. Uh, they also have this tradition of polishing their skirts that yeah. they uh, they repeatedly dye in indigo, and they are like sheen. I mean, I've seen them in an exhibition, and it's almost like the whale that you showed with you know very tiny, very sort of um, uh, uh, these um, tiny pleats. So they have this whole skirt, and they shine like. You know, it's like a leather sheen. Um, yes, but also, also, good. also, you know about indigo having antibacterial properties. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, because, uh, you know, one of my friends who works in Kutch and all, he used to say that, you know, the Kutchi women also wear very dark clothing. And the way for them to cleanse them is to dip them in indigo. Vat. Okay. So it kind of cleanses the cloth as well as re -dyes it. And uh, I had attended one, um, uh, it was last year or year before last when uh, mm -hmm. I had gone to a conference and where there was a whole section on indigo. And they were talking about indigo from various regions of the world. And there was uh, people it's from, such uh, from, from some of the African countries and they were talking about uh, the antibacterial property yeah. <laughs> as well. Yeah. And also, yeah. um, I mean, I was looking at the whales and, you know, because I'm an anthropologist, so of course, uh -huh. Levi Strauss and bricolage, <laughs> you know, it comes in yeah. that you, that you put in together, whatever is comes in your hand, you know, the magpie and the bricolage. Yes. So that is what, and that kind of makes the whales very individualistic. So as you sort of your last sentence before I asked the question was that, that um, yes. that when the people embellish whales with what interests them, then they, instead of hiding their personalities, it's actually bringing out their personalities, and they also you recognize the individual from the whale. <laughs> yeah, I always like to think that you know you, when you're in the desert, you find little stones or little objects mm. that you like, and and of course you know you. Um, well, we carry, I'm not sure if you do, but I, <laughs> I certainly do, I carry little stones around or little shells that I find. And it's nice to be able to, you know, sew them to your dress or to your garment that you wear. I really like it. But also, I mean, um, this is a totally different thing, but, you know, there was once, um, I remember hearing a paper on when the saints used to travel, their tunics from inside used to have a lot of different herbs and stones soon in them and which were both sort of had healing and, um, you know, also repelling oh, of evil spirits. Yeah, so that's, lovely. that is also there, yeah. Um, and what else was there? Uh, there was a very interesting, I mean, I was quite interested on your hair extensions, whether you were able to also find out were the hair extensions, when you said there was also a trade, so was it within the community or it was also from outside? Do you, are able, but for that you will require a DNA genetic analysis, which, yes, is, they would, which is a different. Yeah, <laughs> totally that would different. require DNA analysis and uh, also mm. DNA analysis over a large scale of the population. Mm. So I think that would be impossible, yeah. but you can clearly see in some of these, uh, in yeah. some of these hair extensions that uh, the structure of the hair and the color is completely different from what, from the person who's wearing it. Wow. And also they have different colored extensions. So they have sometimes hair from, so each individual might have hair from two or three individuals um, uh, or donors okay. in their mm -hmm. own uh, hairstyle. Mm -hmm. So it was quite, um, and, and also it's not strange because hair was a commodity, you know, you could, uh, you can grow it and you can sell it. So it uh, oh, still yeah. happens today. So. Yeah. And um, uh, have you seen that documentary by Rehana? It was some years ago. She actually, it was, it's very interesting. It takes you in a different okay. direction, but Rihanna, the singer, she did a documentary on hair extension and she okay. took out these. Yeah, she actually picked up these hair extension from the shops and got through the DNA labs and all kinds of things and found 
found where were the extensions coming from and they were from Eastern European countries and one of them was from South India and from the DNA analysis of the diet and all the ecological things that I was thinking Sonali uh -huh. about all those all those other papers you have had presentations where you know how the analysis of um, of the uh, uh, what is it called a material tells you about the ecology about the environment and about the diet of the person and I mean I was thinking my goodness it all of this comes into it I think it's available on YouTube um, I mean I could send Sonali the link yes. if I find it that it's a very oh. interesting documentary I would I love mean, to see it this was almost maybe 10 years ago it came out but um, it's very good um, I think I will let, uh, okay, one more thing about, you You told us, you showed us about whales which are colored red from inside. So is that madar or something? Because a lot of these dyes also have, you know, um, uh, these health related <laughs> properties. So I do not know, because if you think, okay, I will, why I'm thinking about it, is because right now with all of us having to wear different masks, you know, you're breathing into it. So yeah. your, your, your breath contains a lot of bacteria, the saliva when you're talking. So what is the way you will prevent that? And it might be indigo and madar, the dyes that are creating okay, that environment, you know, which, is, which comes into a kind of a traditional way of doing things, but there must be some benefit of it. Um, just, just a thought. Actually, I can- It's a very I'm functional not... kind of approach, but still. <laughs> I'm but not sure how, about the dyes that are used uh, how, in these cloths. Sorry. Yeah, but how? But how do you keep the whales clean if you're wearing them all the time? Some except of them, from, are get, except from inside the house, when you are, when you can probably take them off. Um, yeah, but many of these women, there are Bedouin, and they live, you know, in the deserts, and they wear these things. And, and deserts, so in any case, you wouldn't have that much moisture and things. So yeah, I'm not sure. Some of them are really dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> but um, so I'm not sure if they ever cleaned mm -hmm. it or if they cle cleaned it at all. I'm assuming they would, you know, somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, there are only a few veils in my collection that have a lining on the inside um, that resembles, you know, like dyed cloth, as you mentioned it. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them have like very synthetic. Um, okay. floral patterns on the inside uh, mm -hmm. uh, or um or 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 what uh, what i showed you like, uh, mm -hmm. like masking tape like uh, yeah tape masking tape yeah. Mm -hmm. um so i guess then you could take it off or or and yeah. put new masking mm -hmm. tape on it i'm not sure but um, um and other thing, um, you know, Emma Tarlow, uh, she wrote that wonderful book called uh, Clothing Matters, which was on Gujarat and clothing. And, but it's really good if, you, if you're interested right. in dress. Yeah. Uh, but she also recently, um, uh, I mean, her last research was on whales and the fashion of whales. And it is on London and, you know, those who have converted to Islam and those who, who were Islamic in any case. And then, you know, what kind of whale fashions have come? And so it's very interesting. Of course, it's different from what you are looking at. But at the same time, you know, as a as a scholar, you would be interested in knowing, OK, course, what are the yes. other ideas and especially fashion and things? What's happening? Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm uh, very, um, I'm very um, determined to keep all sorts of religious and political issues mm -hmm. out. Of it. Uh, I've, I've given talks on the topic of veils for, I think, 10 years. Mm -hmm. and, um, what I find is that it's very difficult to, to start appreciating the textiles for what they are. Um, if you're constantly um, thinking about the oppression of women or um, then you hardly see that they are like appreciated textiles or appreciated garments as well. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, more jewels in their own right. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's I mean, what you you yeah. find it fascinating the veil fashions and what yes. kind of different drapes and things and you know even yes. the doc so many yes. YouTube videos of people draping <laughs> yeah, the veils yeah, yeah. in different ways. <laughs> also, so, yeah. by the way, on um, on uh, Kohl and uh, Surma, um, Surma. Um, um, yeah. how do you call that? Um, recipes on how to mm -hmm. to uh, produce it produce yeah it. it's really lovely yeah. mm -hmm.
Great. Okay. <laughs> I will let others speak. <laughs> yeah, 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 and you mentioned the names in the chat, so you might yes, be able yes, to. Yes, I saw it. Yeah. I saw it. Yeah. And I do want to thank you, Vibhaji, you know, with the, or... Um, uh, and Edmund content. Leach writes on magical hair. Please, please read that article. Shall yeah. I send you the article? It's available on, on JSTOR. I would Store, love so. to read it. Yes, thank yeah, you. Because it's about, about sexuality and hair. And since Leach worked among the Kachins of Burma, so uh, he, and and he also talked about my field area, which is uh, Nagaland, about you know the, the various lengths of the hair and how it is tied up and how it relates to age and sexuality and everything. Oh, so nice! It's very yes. very interesting. Yeah. So all your braiding and things can also go into <laughs> all that. Nice. And you know, uh, Vibhaji, I was thinking, huh? uh, you know, these uh, articles that you suggest and the books, it's so um, important for each one of us to take from mm -hmm. each talk and, uh, you know, those of us who are interested to uh, uh, go deeper into the subject. And I feel that in the chat, it's kind of lost. I really want a way where you can, you know, uh, have that so that we can post it also so that everybody yeah. benefits. So, yes. um, yeah, I mean, I do not know. I mean, uh, maybe on your thing, WhatsApp one thing, on the, the group link. or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we should. Uh... I mean, I can email you the links. Yeah, and that certain is... articles are maybe available quite easily now. Yeah, that will be one. Others, so... others are behind a firewall. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think it will be so uh, helpful to uh, those, you know, mm -hmm. and I just love. Uh, love it that uh, you know your input it's so valuable so I, I really want to thank you for sometimes that sometimes I feel like it might be irritating people that she's always no, no, no. about no. the same stuff <laughs> not at all not at all I think no, I, I think we're so used to when kind of departmental talks if somebody mentions a books and you put the link to the book and things or you put a link so no no I like it, it it's but very it's a bit of informal and formal kind of thing so that's, and that's what it's all about you know like today Yolanda was talking about that little thing she found in Morocco and uh, Aros, Arosa yeah uh, uh, Arosa. not the Arosa no no, the, no not Arosa yeah uh, which which Lakshmi ji said, you know, she oh, has. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Called. That um, that little. Yeah. And this is thing. and this is what interaction is all about. You get to know more. You get to learn more. You know things mm -hmm. that Yolanda may be oblivious of, or we on mm -hmm. this side are oblivious of. There's a exchange of information. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what's so vibrant about this platform. Yeah. <laughs> So um, uh, we okay, will take. I shall the, disappear now. Uh, no, don't from disappear. The, from the screen. From the screen. <laughs> okay, we have uh, uh, Samantha uh, who's joining us for the first time today. And before Samantha, you uh, ask your question. I have put up a poll, which accidentally, inadvertently, I've written on November fifteenth. You attend. It actually is on November fifteenth. Will you attend in view of Diwali week? a talk on mapping and navigating the Himalayas by a friend of mine, he's a mountaineer. And of course, those who work in the Himalayas, even if you are an, uh, you know, uh, you are an academic, it's very important that you know how to navigate the Himalayas, you know your terrain, you know where you are. So uh, Shahid is a very, very experienced mountaineer and he'll tell you about, uh, you know, he's almost like, uh, Brill Gare, what's his name? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the yeah. Who is, yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, it's not going to be a talk on survival techniques, but of course, for us, it's very important that when you're looking at villages, when you're climbing, altitude, all of those things, what kind of um, things you need uh, to make your research more worthwhile, more approachable. And it's just not for the um, 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 small group that you are in, you're studying. It's also for everybody else who learns from that uh, experience, be it culturally, archeologically, art historically. And of course, you know, that whole terrain is very important. So please do attend uh, for those who love the Himalayas and who want to explore the Himalayas with an experienced mountaineer. So he will be ah. here next week, okay? Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> so over to Samantha. And uh, those of you who haven't um, filled in your input for the poll, please do that. It really helps me. It will really help me in curating the future talks that we'll have. So, okay. Over to you, Samantha. Thank you, Sonali. 
And thank Hi. you, Yolanda. This is really, I've been following your work for a long time. So this is really, really. Yes, I noticed. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely to see your face to it. <laughs> yeah. um, so I had a question because you mentioned something about the veil, but you were talking about how it changes our senses. And I, the, I know you, as an archaeologist, your research is maybe more artifacts that are historical and, or mm -hmm. sometimes we look at the material object as, you know, here's the object, but I guess I, I, something about the sensory or experiential quality of wearing an item, or there's things we can only learn by that, you know, we're missing in our research by not actually being able to experience that sense mm -hmm. of the physicality that literally embodies it, you know, and I guess it's my experience as a dancer too, that I, you only understand certain things beyond the intellectual by uh -huh. the physicality of it. And you go, oh, yes. it clicks, you know, so I wearing, agree. I don't know if, you know, and when we adorn ourselves in whatever way, I mean, we, you know, we feel it, but it, to understand, like, not just a veil, for example, but you put on ankle bracelets and you feel, oh, that draws your attention, your whole ex uh -huh. experience of how somebody would walk through the world in um, all these experiences that I don't know how, how like maybe you could speak on that, you know, because I don't think I can walk around, uh, you know, with a Bedouin face veil, but to experience <laughs> what that feels like. Well, I've definitely considered it. <laughs> the, <laughs> you know, and in our house, it's not the same context, but even just um, rituals, these things, the physicality that it brings this deeper understanding of, you know, beyond the intellectual or all the amazing mm -hmm. aspects, but that facet that we, you know, uh, maybe, how yes. that how, how how do we get that you know like i mean without traveling and dressing you know that that's maybe not totally realistic but you know if you could speak on that because i feel like that's the part that really clicks it into like a deeper level of uh, understanding for me anyways but um maybe you could speak yeah. on that. you know actually i think, think it's a very uh, it's a very good point um you know, in archaeology, you have things like ethnoarchaeology or uh, anthropology to help you to understand um, what it is like to use a certain tool or what it is like to um, to wear veils. Now, I'm also doing research on beadwork, on ancient beadwork, and um, I have, for instance, remade one of the one of the beaded sandals uh, from Tutankhamun's tomb. And it's very interesting that when you're making an object like that, that you start to understand what the person who made them did. And if you, I would never have guessed if I wouldn't have remade it myself. So um, I found out things that were simply impossible to, to learn from just studying the object. So I guess also wearing a veil, I, I was just, I wasn't joking. I really have considered uh, wearing them because you want to understand what it is like to be to constant, you know, have something on your face or to um, constantly, um, when it moves, it's heavy, you can feel it uh, move. Um, two years ago, I set up an exhibition in a Dutch museum and I, we designed a large table and I put, um, uh, uh, veils down for people to try. So there weren't antique veils, but I bought new ones and I, I, I weigh them, I weigh them down so people could actually try them on and feel what they, what they feel like when you're, uh, you know, when you're in, and imagine what it feels like when you're in the desert or in a hot environment. And I think this is, um, um, I would like to talk about it and to write more about it and to actually feel what it is like. And Sonali was saying um, that nowadays we all feel what it's like to wear a mask. Um, and um, yes, I I just have to submit the poll. Yes, <laughs> um, um, I think I I would like to you know write more about. Um, about this aspect. What is it like to wear this veil? What is it like to wear it in a hot environment? Um, it's not the same as wearing a mask because that actually covers up your, you know, it's, it's around your, your mouth and your nose, whereas a veil allows you to breathe in, to a certain amount, uh, not through the textile, but underneath the textile. But yet it is very, you can see from the insides of, the, of these veils that it's very hot and very humid and very, um, very sweaty underneath. And it makes you think um, these are obvious 
uh, obviously there, these veils are thick, they have thick layers, um, which they must have, they, they applied this for a reason, because if you're wearing um, a veil in, um, with dark colors in the sun and it's directly on your skin, it's very hot. Whereas if you line it with another piece of textile, it somehow stops the heat. So these kind of aspect, aspects, I want to, I want to, um, I will, mm -hmm. I will definitely write up in my, uh, in my book. It's definitely like a, because even just how, you know, uh, maybe it's my experience as a dancer who had, you know, um, would put on a traditional outfit, let's say, for example, um, and then all of a sudden you realize how those parts are, are coming together to attract attention to certain body parts mm -hmm. or, for example, in Tunisian dance, we, they put this temporal and it's very long and you can't move your head faster, it whips you in the face. So you start moving very differently, for example, you don't, yes. you can't move this, your body the same way. Um, you know, you don't think, like you said, you don't think about it until you're actually nope. making the object or putting it on. And then you go, oh, and then you realize it changes your whole, or, you know, a, a, a robe with much, a lot of tissue, like a tissue, that's French yeah. fabric, um, yeah. you know, that you just move your body in a very different way. Um, or to make it, like you said, I think that part is really like uh, the literal embodiment yes. <laughs> of the, of the yes. I mean, obviously Tutankhamun, that's a very ancient, people don't dress like that anymore, but the, um, I find that part very fascinating. So I think uh, I would uh, love to see more work on that, but it's, um, yeah, that really fascinates me. So I don't know. Okay. So many well, ideas. <laughs> no, I will <laughs> definitely, I will definitely uh, use this. I've already, um started experimenting with them interesting i'll keep i'll stay tuned but uh, and how it changes and in, in that we don't use the same you know the five senses the same way if you're you know not breathing uh -huh. not breathing you know you're 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 more yeah. visual rather than odor exactly like odor perfume incense Oriented. is all very relevant so it's very interesting like that those which senses are being highlighted as well so yeah um well thanks great great I, i'll keep you posted i'll keep following <laughs> Good. Thanks. Thanks for attending. Anyways, it's very nice. You know, and uh, what Samantha was saying, uh, I just read a post on Facebook the other day that because of the proximity of the masks that we are wearing these days, our uh, odor, mouth, uh, the mouth odor is becoming so strong. So now people have started uh, the, um, uh, uh, the sale of mouth fresheners has gone up. <laughs> you know, so, so it has uh, an effect. You know, a yeah. mask can have an effect of sale of mouth fresheners. Do have you tried? Have you tried to? Have you tried to eat? Um, you know, mouth freshener with your with your cap on? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, but but I I like I wash my mask every day because there's some kind of you know I just need to have it fresh. You know. Yes. Of course. So yeah. yeah. So uh, the way like these women like you know uh, using frankincense and uh, you know the whole idea of, of phenomenology. So you should definitely, um, who's that, right? I'm forgetting. The, all the phenomenal, uh, the, the, the archaeologists who focus on phenomenology. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So well, especially. Nice. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Especially in Egypt where, you know, uh, so the sugar is always more than the tea. <laughs> and it causes like tooth decay and stuff. And even now, like they would say, oh, Sonali, we are making tea for you. You know, even in, um, and uh, Angela is here. Angela, do you remember the tea? And of course, Yolanda, you, the, yeah. the sugar is all, it's, it's not tea. It's more like having sugar. And they call a it tea. tea yeah, <laughs> with a little bit of tea added to it. So, you know, <laughs> you have to look into that aspect as well. Okay. Interesting suggestion. I will. We are actually on that note. Sorry to interrupt, but um, it's Angela. Hi, Yolanda. Yeah. And thank Hi. you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, I, I don't know if it's my turn to ask a question. So well, should I wait? No, no, no. Is it okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, on that, on that note, I was wondering about this aspect of women in the desert unable to wash their garments periodically that probably purifying them in some sense, either by the types of material used or incense or other ways might just be for the comfort of their own senses that you're planning on studying. So um, the smells that they're smelling, not necessarily what their people around them are smelling off no, their no. garments. 
so that that would be really interesting and, and then on that same note of um olfaction like with women um perhaps as you're studying this how smell um affects these garments or, or um the aspect of that it would be interesting you could also perhaps ask about during pregnancy when women's um sense of smell is heightened are they treating these garments in a different way in terms of smells to mask ones that may be um you know causing harm to them and and discomfort or in some ways it just might be a subtle interesting um, way in which they might use these garments as a way of almost protection or um comfort and then lastly my my other question to you would be with um, have you come across or uh, because these garments seem to be so tied to individuality and expression of that are um, are you finding that these garments are become heirlooms in any way um, either kept in a home as a as a relic of someone that they loved or because they're so individualistic are they not passed on and used by someone else um, because maybe a, that that identity cannot cross over to someone else. I, I was just kind of wondering about the reuse of veils, if that is in fact done, mm -hmm. um, what you found in that respect. Okay, so to start with the last, uh, you see, I don't know. I've asked um, uh, people if they've kept, for instance, their mother's veil or something. And when I ask them also on jewelry, they always say no. But the fact that these garments, you know, show up and aren't uh, aren't uh, thrown out, or um, uh, you know, they are sold as as um, as valuable objects at a certain point, one would think that they're um, that they're kept as heirlooms, and then at a certain point are discarded um, because some of them are almost a century old, for instance. So they've been around for a while. Um, I'm not sure if they're worn by, by uh, other women, for instance. And this is the same as with, uh, with the jewelry items. They're also um, supposed to be sold after a woman has died um, and then remade into a new set because the silver is recycled in a way and made into a new set of, uh, of uh, jewelry items for a new person. But I also found that they stick around for a very long time. So I guess it's um, well, I can't really answer the question uh, <laughs> better than that. Um, in regard to your question about scent, um, the, the research that I want to start with um, uh, on scent is not so much on is what, they, what they wear, but actually what kind of, um, um, what kind of material was used to scent the objects. So was it uh, incense that was used or is it like sweat that makes them smell the way they do or a combination and then what kind of incense? So um, the research we're planning um, will actually identify um, on a molecule level, I guess I have, I don't know, somebody else is going to, <laughs> is going to do the, the, the chemistry. Um, uh, on a molecule level, um, what kind of, you know, how were these objects scented? And uh, in regard to what you're saying about pregnant women, that would be very interesting. I'm going to ask the question to a friend of mine who can uh, probably um, answer it. Nice, thanks. Thanks. Thank Angela. you. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I really I enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I remember that uh, when I was uh, giving birth to Rudra, while uh -huh. I was giving birth to Rudra, uh, we were talking about the, uh, the doctor and I, we were talking about uh, birthing practices in Egypt. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think that kept uh, my composure during the birthing process. So <laughs> sorry to be graphic, but each time I was, uh, you know, when I had time to talk and I would say, you know, in Egypt, uh, in um, Dendara, this is how they, you know, used to give birth. <laughs> so uh -huh. that, yeah. So the, all, all these things are so important. Little things are so important. And yeah. again, coming back to the experience of it all is very important because when you experience yeah. it, you know what are your limitations? How mm -hmm. will you navigate those limitations? What would you do? Because we are all humans after all. We are yes. all wired a certain way, right? So yeah. yeah, such a fascinating journey and so much more to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Definitely. So, um, as we all do, okay, so uh, the, the poll is still going on. Sorry, uh, I was distracting you guys in between with the poll. That's Only nine, nine people have voted. Uh, please, <laughs> please. Uh, yeah, now there's a balance of how many are going to attend and how many are not. So those who are not attending will miss them, but the show must go on, as they say. <laughs> so, yeah, and Jolanda, of course, um, now that you'll be uh, uh, working in close contact uh, with us, so uh, uh, you and Lonica, so I would love you to attend so you can find your yes. orientation in the Himalayas as well. Yes, if I ever come, I can find my way back or... <laughs> exactly. Don't worry, we'll be there to guide you, but still, <laughs> you never know what might happen. No, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, uh, as we uh, depart uh, for today, uh, we have this tradition of having our speaker say a few words of wisdom. Wow, words of wisdom. What mm -hmm. would you like uh, the viewers to uh, leave with, you know? Does it have to be related to my topic? No, no, anything. Anything? Yeah. Well, um, okay. Um, it, I, will, I will make a remark that's related to the topic. So if you're all, you know, wearing masks um, in the, the near future, so please tell me your experience from... Um, uh, let me know, or we, you can share. You can share my email, right, uh, Sonali, with uh, with everybody. Let me know how you experience wearing a cloth in front of your face, your mouth, and if people look at you differently, or uh, you know, if you smell or breathe something uh, differently. I would be very interesting, uh, interested to know. And um, well, of course, everybody, um, keep up the good work with uh, staying Corona COVID nineteen free. And, uh, I hope um, everybody will stay healthy. Thank you. And I think it's time we wear those beautiful uh, veils with yes. the coins and the beads <laughs> and be more innovative. So they look, you know, beautiful, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And before departing, we'll meet next week with uh, Shahid Khan's talk on mapping and navigating the Himalayas. A lot of us do not know how to read maps and some who really want to learn how to do it. So please do that. And uh, he scaled many peaks and uh, um, is an inspiration of sorts. So uh, please do be in attendance if you can. And uh, a lot more is coming in the month of December. Uh, please follow our Facebook page, Instagram, all that social media. We have to be uh, in touch. And uh, uh, very soon, uh, Yolanda, uh, and us uh, and Lonica, we will be uh, telling you about uh, a publication that we'll be doing together. And all of you are a part of it. So uh, watch out for all that news and our first workshop in the month of December. Uh, I'll be posting the news shortly. So take care. Have a great, great day, night, morning. Bye. Day. Thank you, Shanali. Yeah. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, Vibhaji. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Shanali. Everybody for attending. Thank you, Yolanda, for the wonderful talk. Thank you, talk. Yolanda. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. And I will post Bye. my talk and uh, Manan's talk and Yolanda's talk this week. I'm sorry for the delay. I have just been a little lazy. No problem. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.